Uh, today we are fortunate here in Yerevan to be interviewing Tom Duvall, who is uh, with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, also the author of The Black Garden, which is still uh, considered one of the main pieces of material and references on the Karabakh conflict and a Karabakh and Caucasus expert. So thank you for joining us today. Good to be with you. Yep, we appreciate it. Uh, in the last 24 hours, it's, it's, it's interesting that you came at this time. There have uh, been developments, and you know in the last two or three weeks there have been plenty of developments. Uh, yesterday at the G20 in Mexico, um, presidents from the US, Russia, and France gave a statement. I'll read a little bit of it. They said, the important decisions necessary to reach a lasting and peaceful settlement are important in the case of the Karabakh conflict. Um, what do you take from that? What, what's the meaning of this? Is there any substance behind a statement like that? Well, not much substance, but I think um, symbolism in, in the sense that, I, as far as I know, this is the first statement from a G20 meeting. Usually these um, statements are made at the G8 meeting. So this is uh, a way of, of saying um, that, that we're, we're noticing this issue, that we're, we care about it. Also, we've got two new presidents, a new old president in Russia, Vladimir Putin, and new president of France, uh, Francois Hollande. So it's saying um, just, because, just because we've got change um, in, in Paris and Moscow doesn't mean that we're not paying attention to it. Um, I think Putin obviously didn't show up to the G8 meeting. So this is a way of, of, of traditionally the three, the three presidents um, putting, shining the spotlight on Armenia, Azerbaijan, saying, we're watching you, we don't want to see another war here, um, you know, it's up to you to make a deal. Sure, and uh, these are the three presidents representing the countries that are chairing the Minsk. The, the, the three co-chairs, right. that's right. Uh, unfortunately, from a skeptic standpoint, um, this statement, this article, seems to be the type of statement and article that we have been reading for the last 15 years. Uh, is there anything we can take out of this? Does this mean anything? Well, if, if, if you're a kind of half glass, uh, uh, full person, you would say, um, you know, this um, process is still continuing. There's some still a document on the table. Um, there's um, a massive um, two armies on either side of a ceasefire line, and and this process is being managed. The two sides um, are avoiding mass casualties. A few people are dying, which is unfortunate, um, but we're avoiding mass casualties and not slipping back into war. If you're a, a kind of half glass empty person, you say this process has been going on. Uh, ever since, um, well, for 20 years, since the ceasefire of 94, um, we're no closer to a deal. In fact, we're, we're probably even further in, from a deal because the two societies are drifting apart and they don't really trust each other and the peace process is going nowhere. So um, I guess the question for anyone who follows this process is, is there a way of kind of keeping the good management part of, of, of no war and yet um, boosting it up, bolstering it up so that we can move closer to peace? Sure. Uh, some of the half-full people might be struggling at the moment because uh, recently there have been casualties. Um, Monday, uh, there was an Armenian soldier killed along the line of contact. There's also been uh, injuries on the Azeri side. And you know, of course, two weeks ago, uh, there were three Armenian soldiers killed along the Azeri-Armenian border and uh, near the northern Armenian border. Uh, and then a day later, five Azeris were killed by Armenians. That also coincided with uh, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's visit. So. Uh, I guess we'll start broadly. Tell me what you took from those uh, events, and then we'll dive into it a little deeper. Well, I mean, obviously, it's very hard, um, particularly from a distance, um, to judge exactly what happened in those instances. You're going to hear very differing accounts. Of the, there are just aren't enough OSC monitors um, to tell us uh, what happened conclusively. But clearly, the timing was unfortunate, if not very suspicious. Um, it looked as though someone, and I, I really couldn't say who, was trying to draw attention to this conflict uh, to coincide with the visit of Hillary Clinton when Hillary Clinton was actually bringing a message of peace. And it rather overshadowed her uh, trip to both uh, Yerevan and Baku that, that a lot of her time was just was taken up just w with purely what was going on rather than moving the, the peace process forward. Um, but, but what would... Uh uh, what, what, what was the message if somebody was trying to send a message? Because we've heard many theories, and one theory we've heard is, you know, Armenians and Azeris are, are sort of trying to solve this conflict, but really they don't know how to solve it. And this is a reminder of, look, we have this thing, will you please solve it for us or do something along those lines? One, what do you think of a theory like that? And if, if you don't buy into it, um, what is the message of having all this violence, one of the most violent days since the ceasefire, around the same time as U.S. Secretary of State visits? Well, you, you do get this view in the Caucasus that, um, and, and it, it, this is a, a region that has been colonized for centuries and has only achieved 
uh, independence, uh, proper independence 20 years ago. You do get the idea, the view that the Caucasus countries are the pawns and the puppets and the great powers, whether it be in the US, Russia, Europe, Turkey, Iran, that they are the puppet masters or the chess players. Uh, I take the opposite view, that in fact, um, um, basically, it's the locals who, who manipulate the great powers. The locals have their strong interests. Uh, they dig in. Um, they use the great powers. They play them off against each other. The great powers don't have a, a big, constant interest in this region, or they have a number of interests. That the locals are very good at playing them off against each other. And so, um, but when you, when you can't solve a conflict like this, it's very difficult to, obviously. Um, it involves a huge kind of wrenching uh, turn around in your whole national strategy and in your national identity, um, then the easy thing is to, is to blame the outsiders, say, well, we can't make a deal, but it's, we're, we're just small Armenia, Karabakh, Azerbaijan, we're being pushed around by the, by the great powers. And so there's a sense in which you can, if you cause a bit of tension on the line of contact, you're drawing in the great powers, um, you're, 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 you're kind of encouraging um, them to do things for you. Um, I guess the trouble with that is, is, is that if they do finally decide to make decisions for you, they, they might be decisions you don't like. Yeah, of course. Um, maybe we don't feel this tension as much two weeks later, but I don't know. I mean, there, were, there was talk around that time of you know, constant retaliation, and we're in this cycle, and uh, you know, it's well documented that Azerbaijan spells more, spends more than Armenia's entire budget on uh, military and defense. And it's also well documented that even though the budget is small, Armenia spends a large chunk of its budget on military and defense at all. Um, do you think, you know, after what happened two weeks ago and, and all that information, do you think we're close to large scale war again? I don't think we are at the moment. I think, um, I, I, I think for one thing, um, war, it's very unlikely we'll see war by miscalculation. These uh, militaries are under fairly tight political control. I mean, a few, Snipers, bullets here and there, sure, um, which can which can kill a few a few people tragically, but the use of heavier weapons, um, you know, artillery, absolutely, that would be a political decision. Um, and I think um, both sides have a strong interest at the moment uh, not to start conflict. The Armenian side, because they basically have what they want on the ground, and the Azerbaijani side, because if you, um, you know, they're in the process of. Of, of getting wealthy in the process of building up a military, um, why gamble that all the way now when you could um, lose everything that you've gained? So both sides have an interest now. I think that the danger is that three or five years down the, the line, that much cal calculations could change. I mean, who's putting a date on it? But um, and you know, Azerbaijan is a a fairly dynamic country in both a positive and neg negative sense. In, in a positive sense, in the, in the sense that it's it's growing much wealthier and stronger as a state. A negative sense, there's a lot of countervailing pressures. There's problems with Iran. Um, there's some internal tensions in Azerbaijan, and and at some point, um, if things start to go worse in Azerbaijan, the temptation could be that the the the, the way to rally around the flag is to play the Karabakh card. Start start something against the Armenians, which is the one kind of national project, the national idea that can unify the country and, and neutralize any opposition. Right, and in this whole region, including Georgia, this is the next two to three years, this is election season, uh, so to speak. We just had a parliamentary election. Azerbaijan has one coming up. Armenia has a presidential election in 2013. Georgia's going through the same type of thing. Um, when you mention political issues, is there a chance? There's also an election coming up in a month in Karabakh itself, which is not recognized, but is an election. When you mention political issues, um, is there a chance that election season can correspond with this escalation? There is a chance, but I, I, I don't. And I think elections make things more complicated here because uh, leaders are more concentrated on shoring up their own domestic capital, and therefore they get cautious about you know doing deals with their with their neighbours. So that you know slows things down. But I, I don't think elections are the big trigger, and possibly more in in Armenia because Armenia, as we know, has a more dynamic domestic politics than either Karabakh or or Azerbaijan. You know, um, we pretty much know who's going to win any elections in Azerbaijan and in Karabakh. Armenia, we we. We, we think we know, but, but there's always going to be a, a, a challenge out there, so it's a bit more unpredictable. I think, I think the, 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 the wild cards are, one, um, you know, 
the oil and gas market, if, there's, uh, if there for some reason would be to a plunge in the oil price, the oil price is actually going up at the moment, but who knows. And but it's done a lot of this lately. Uh, and yeah. secondly, Iran. I mean, um, Azerbaijan, I think, has actually been doing quite a decent job of managing its relations with Iran, but there's been a lot of provocations. There have been assassination plots against Israelis, possibly against Americans in Baku, traceable back to Tehran. And there's a lot of tension um, with Iran. And if that crisis gets worse, um, Iran could easily pick on Azerbaijan as a kind of pro-Western neighbor to provoke and cause problems with. Which would then mean what? Which could then mean destabilization in, 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 in Baku. And again, any destabilization in Baku, I think, is bad for the Karabakh peace process. Destabilization in Baku tends to mean potential for escalation in Karabakh? Yeah, and, and I think the, the worry is that a political decision could be made on the... Remember, this is a ceasefire line with you know 20,000 plus troops on either side, right. 100 miles long, uh, right. just around Karabakh, not counting the two borders, six OSC monitors who visit twice a month, so basically zero international presence. So if a political decision was made just to, you know, try something on the ceasefire line, you know, maybe a day's worth of mort mortars or artil artillery, um, you know, the sides have no contact. We know there are Karabakh Armenians who believe, um, they may be a minority, but they're, they're, they're a, s a strong minority, I think, who believe um, that actually what we need is another small war in which to, to bring Azerbaijan to its senses. Mm. Um, and, you know, those two forces could start playing with each other. And, and, you know, we could have a small war which would last a week and which, you know, you know, you know, let's hope it doesn't happen. You know, lots of people could get killed and, and the peace process could, could be, you know, dead in the water. Yeah. Um, Thomas Duvall, thank you for joining us. I'm going to finish with this because we talked, it was in 2011, but uh, it was after uh, discussions had kind of broken down, but things were pretty cold along the line of contact. Today, that's not the case. Uh, things are not quite as cold. So in where you're sitting today, um, it's hard to play chess, but do you see that, uh, at the moment, right now, we're closer to peace or we're closer to conflict? We're still somewhere stuck in the middle. I, d I, d I, I don't want to be alarmist about conflict. I don't see it happening at the moment. Um, but we're, we're, we're not near peace. Um, Bob Bradkey, the American co-chair, mm -hmm. has said a couple of times, and I think it's worth listening to him, that the two sides are actually closer to each other than they think. You know, on, on, that actually um, the differences between them on paper actually uh, not, not so big. Um, the problem is, and it's you know it's a problem which is probably widening. Is there's, there's absolutely no trust between them. There's 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 there's, there's no kind of incent, There's no willingness to kind of help the other side achieve a peace agreement to kind of get into a kind of positive spiral, a positive dynamic. Um, so I think that's where what we should be thinking about. Not not about you know a paragraph here about the Latin corridor or you know. Uh, this and that, or changing the format. It should be what we should be thinking about is how can we get a kind of a truce, uh, a rhetoric truce, a rhetoric ceasefire between the two sides. How can and how can we, how can there be a kind of period in which the two sides somehow think uh, about helping each other, trusting each other? And may, maybe the co-chairs are a problem here. Maybe the fact that you've got three. Uh, mediators sitting there in the room can be a problem. Maybe maybe the co-chairs should just step back and leave them in a room. Do you believe that? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think the co-chairs are needed, but I think there's, a, there's a, a sense in which, you know, you just need the two sides to sit together in a room for however long it takes to kind of work out how they can talk to each other. I think they've forgotten how to talk to each other. Thank you, uh, Thomas Duvall. We, have, um, we always say that hopefully the next time we speak to you, uh, we'll be talking about peace. Hard to say if we're any closer okay. to that right now, but, but we, yep, exactly. So okay. thank you so much for joining okay. us. Okay, thank you.